Hey everybody, can everyone hear me? I'm not the expert uh, like Eric, so yay. Let me know if you can hear me uh, and if we're having any issues with the sound. Let me make sure everything's good. Here we go. Let's unmute. I don't need to hear myself. Good to go. Okay. Thank you. It was a smidge of a delay, so if I get a little robot -y, let me know. I'm doing my best. I'm not normally the host here. I'm just a substitute for Eric, which I know I will never be as great as Eric, but we'll give it our best shot. Uh, so today, good. Thank you for letting me know the audio good. Today we're going to talk about, very quickly, one short thing that I've had a couple clients ask me about. Uh, and life is worrisome enough, and I don't want people worrying about losing their social security. Yeah, Eric's, and Eric's doing great. Uh, Eric's not here. I'm filling in for him because I believe he is uh, doing a little bit of uh, work for another nonprofit. Uh, Eric helps out a lot of people. So I am with you now. Uh, I am an attorney. I'm an attorney here in California, but as you probably know by now, we have clients all over the United States. Uh, so if I'm lucky enough to talk to you in a different state, that's great. Uh, really quickly, I just don't want to waste anyone's time too much because I know we're all busy here. I want to talk about the, uh, the if you've heard the rumor about a, uh, a bail-in taking your social security income. It's not going to happen. Uh, but let's let's talk about that a little bit. A few people have asked me about it, and uh, I don't want anyone to worry about things they don't need to worry about. Because honestly, these days we have enough stuff to worry about organically without adding bonus worries. So let's see if my ability to jump over to my browser is going to work. Let's see. So. I've been asked a couple times uh, because some advertisements have been running and I think a few articles and different sources on the internet uh, if a bail-in is going to result in banks reaching into their bank accounts and uh, scooping out their social security income. So I want everyone to know, first of all, that's not going to happen. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act which was passed a while ago now, 2010, included language about uh, bail-ins, where you know we've no we've had the bailouts multiple times, where the federal government has stepped in and paid for banks' uh, insolvency essentially to keep them from failing and help the economy. Uh, and part of the language in in Dodd Frank contained. Uh, contained language about uh, banks being dependent on their own funds. Uh, this has been misinterpreted a few times uh, on the internet to uh, scare people essentially or seem newsworthy that we were, were all at risk of having banks scoop in into our own uh, bank accounts and take our money. Um, and a few clients have been concerned about that. Well, the first thing to understand is banks are using our money all the time. Anyways, it's why I tell clients you need to tell your bank to earn its money uh, and stop a payment or do what it's supposed to do because banks are all making money off of our money. That's why they take care of your money for you and that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, but banks are already using our money all the time. That's how they lend money. Uh, but also, all of us have our money uh, deposited. If you have your money deposited into a bank or a credit union in uh, the United States, it's insured. And it's insured by the uh, FDIC up to $250,000 in account. Now, most of us aren't really too plagued by the problem of having more than $250,000 of liquidity or money to stick in a bank account. but if we're silly and imagine we do for a second, you can absolutely put your million dollars in four different bank accounts and have it fully insured. So not only are you 
already having your money used by your bank, the federal government is insuring your deposits. I don't want anyone to worry about losing their precious funds in the bank account due to a rumored bail-in. If you hear about the bail-in, you can give us a call. I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. But I'm also sharing this letter right now on the screen because it's a letter from, um, it's kind of old, but this rumor's been out there for a while. It seems like most internet rumors go through cycles, and this one seems to be having an active state lately. Um, so this letter from the, uh, the 2020 director or the head counsel uh, for the Federal Reserve explains pretty clearly, clearly, excuse me, that the uh, part of the Dodd-Frank Act that the internet or certain sources on the internet are using to scare people is called the Orderly Liquidation Authority. So this seems really dry and boring, but I want you to understand that this part of this law, if you hear it on a, a news channel or you see something on Facebook or any other internet source, this orderly liquidation authority part of the Dodd-Frank Act doesn't mean you're going to lose your money. It means that a bank, uh, if a bank has to go into bankruptcy and has is becomes financially unstable, has uh, the uh, ability to, well, essentially pull from its own resources before it gets to be bailed out again by the federal government. So just a quick note on that. Um, I just don't want you to be scared about things you don't need to be scared about. We're all scared enough. So I'm going to pull that off now that we've had that fun, exciting part. And let's talk about utilities. I'm talking to people from all over the United States, and it's cold. Even here where I'm at in Southern California, believe it or not, it's still cold. It's 40 degrees outside right now. And... I don't know about your natural gas bills, if you live somewhere where you rely on natural gas for heat, but mine has gone up by, mm, I'd say, easily five or 600% this year, which is a lot of money. Um, it's a lot. And I hate thinking about people being cold. Or, on the opposite side, in the summer, I hate think about, thinking about people, uh, well, roasting in their own homes, because that's just as dangerous. And when people call me uh, with enormous utility bills, unlike a credit card debt or a medical debt or a collection agency, uh, it's a different predicament because almost everyone who calls about a utility bill wants to keep their utilities on. And I don't blame them. We need power. If you live somewhere with natural gas, you need your natural gas. We need to keep our utilities on for the most part. Um, I know a lot of people, I'm always surprised by how resourceful some of our clients are, how much hardship some of our clients have gone through. And I've unfortunately spoken to too many people going to some pretty extraordinary means to get access to water and power and gas. But you really shouldn't have to do that. Um, my first thing that I want everyone to understand is if you're in a big city, I'm in Los Angeles. If you are in a big city and you're having a hard time with uh, water or power, do a little bit of research because in a lot of big cities during the uh, pandemic and in some cities even beforehand, policies have been changed uh, to no shutoff orders. Just pretty much blanket. No matter how high your bill gets, they're not going to shut off your power. And that's somewhat because of good intentions uh, for people's welfare, but just as much it's because the city, actually, most big cities lose more money off um, from shutoffs. Uh, houses where water isn't flowing uh, hurts the whole city's water system. Electricity means, lack of electricity means people end up using other resources and economically it hurts the city more to shut off its citizens' power. So if you're in a big city, Check, check out where your city's at with the shutoffs right now. That's my first piece of advice. Our city just changed the policy here. I know Detroit changed this policy a few years ago. A lot of cities aren't shutting things off anymore in the first place. Not that that really helps with stress uh, on an ongoing basis, but perhaps maybe if you're stuck with unaffordable utilities and you know they're not going to shut them off anyways, like with debt, you can only do what you can do. So I want everyone to understand that if you're in a big city, 
that might be an option. Uh, however, we're not all in big cities, which is a good thing. I don't blame you if you're not. Uh, but I really, really want to make sure everybody knows about LIHEAP. LIHEAP is a, a federal program, but it has local applications for all of us. Uh, it stands for low income, it's low income home energy uh, assistance uh, program. And it has some version of itself wherever you're at. Uh, it's not just for electricity, it's also for uh, water, because we need water too. If you live somewhere without a well, you are probably using city water. So let's talk about LIHEAP a little bit. I like to send clients, we're gonna go back to the internet here, so bear with me, hopefully I do it right. I like to send clients to the federal website when we talk about LIHEAP because sometimes just finding your local relief agency is a lot, especially when you're stressed out. So if you need help, you can actually go to the uh, LIHEAP website. This URL looks really complicated. You don't have to remember all of that nonsense. And we will have this on our website or if you need a call and get this information from us. We're happy to give it to you. So I don't want anyone to be too overwhelmed by this massive blanket of uh, data that I'm spitting at you here. But this website right here, you don't have to use this whole complicated forward slash URL or address to get to there. You can just go to energyhelp.us. It really is that simple. It'll take you straight to this site. Energyhelp.us. That simple. And if you go to that this website, you're going to see, uh, well, you're going to see a few things. Let's talk about them. The first one is the one I think will probably work for most people. You can just call this uh, toll-free number, 866-674-6327, and let them know you need, well, you need help with uh, your energy bill. Um, as you can see, let's scroll down. If they can help with your actual electricity, uh, but maybe you're somewhere like where I am, where most of the stuff in your house works with natural gas. Uh, even if you are in uh, a trailer or a rural situation, they can help with propane, uh, fuel oil. I know some places still use that, or even wood. I lived somewhere for a year where we relied exclusively off of wood for heat. It was pretty rural, uh, but boy, I was sure grateful for all that wood. Kept me and my, uh, well, it kept my baby warm and it kept me warm. And so I'm, I'm not one to underestimate the power of good old fashioned wood for heat. Uh, they can also help you out in a, in a crisis. If you are in a situation where your, uh, your electricity or gas has already been shut off, please, please don't put yourself in danger please reach out to this agency and or even give us a call and I will scour the internet to see if I can find any help for you. It, but this agency by and large has been pretty good to our clients. They really do have a lot of connections. Um, and by calling them and saying, I don't have heat in the winter, or I don't have air conditioning, which can be just as dangerous in the, in the summer they will bump you to the front of the line. Uh, they can also help with the repair of your heating and cooling uh, equipment. I don't know about you, but I know that air conditioning, if you're lucky enough to have it, loves to break at the worst moments and it's always expensive to fix. At least it's expensive to me. Uh, if you qualify, they will help you uh, fix your air conditioning or HVAC or your heat heat repair, uh, furnace repair, that's not cheap either. Um, they will also help with uh, really good, uh, well, they help with weatherization. We have a cold house, but I have learned the hard way that shutting those darn curtains really helps. They can help you with those things that help keep you, uh, keep your house a little bit warmer so there's less uh, less impact on the overall warmth of your house and you can stay a little bit more warm. Um, and then finally, you can talk to them about uh, if you've been in a natural disaster, they will have extra resources for you. 
I know uh, a lot of our clients have been pretty much in uh, an apocalyptic snowstorm on occasion this winter. Uh, some of our clients in Indiana, some of our clients in Texas, all of our clients in the Midwest. You guys are pretty tough when it comes to snow and weather and knowing how to deal with that. But still, at the end of the day, sometimes things weigh too much for your roof. Sometimes things outside of your home go completely and they can help with that. Uh, FEMA helps with natural disasters, but actually life can help you with the immediate impact uh, to your access to power. So by all means, uh, reach out for that situation too. Uh, and then finally, you can email uh, Lyheap. If you're an email person, you like email, I like email, you like to keep a record of your conversations uh, in a written way, that's great. You can email them. Uh, and then finally, you can find your, uh, your office near you. They have a lot of reach. They have, there are even, uh, offices that are funded by LIHEAP, uh, in Puerto Rico. So non-state and even, uh, tribal agencies, uh, they get funding from LIHEAP. So this really, this, uh, federal agency really does have quite a bit, uh, out there for you. But if you find that you've You've reached out to them, and for whatever reason, you're not getting the access that you need. Uh, there is also a strange trick, and I don't know why, but this works. But sometimes a lie heap isn't always as perfect as it should be. Also, reach out to 211. They may be able to connect you with some local nonprofits. Uh, we had a client a few months ago who had was already using LIHEAP, but we found a, a nonprofit for veterans. She was a veteran and uh, they supplemented the uh, the funding from LIHEAP and she got a brand new furnace from this nonprofit. So 211 is also a good place to call. Uh, if you have 211 in your area, most of us do now. So that's another that's another option to check too. Uh, so this utility information, by all means, please give us a call. If you need to learn more or know more, uh, we can't we can't keep the utilities on for you. I wish I could, uh, but I will let you know whatever information I have access to. So now that we've got that covered, let's let's go to the next thing really quickly. I want everyone I've probably told everyone a million times. It feels like. Uh, when they're dealing with a jerky bank, uh, not necessarily regarding a uh, debt collection issue, but just a bank that's not doing its job. Remember, I said your bank needs to earn your money because it's making money off your money. Even if you feel like your monthly contribution of Social Security benefits doesn't rain compared to the millionaires uh, that put their wealth into the financial institution, I don't care. They need to earn your money they get to make money off of your social security benefits. They need to do things for you. So we're going to talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau here just for a second, because I'm a huge fan. For whatever reason, uh, well, we're really, really lucky that we have a strong federal regulatory agency uh, that makes sure consumers are treated fairly by banks. Let's make sure this broadcast service can go here. You can see me Googling it. Um, and I'm just showing you I can find it. It's that simple. Here we are. Let's go to this exciting website here. I want to show you one of the coolest things that I don't think everyone knows about. It's not really cool, probably on a woohoo party with rock and roll, roll stars level, but it's cool to me. It's cool to anyone who works with consumer debt. Um, and I will get to your questions, I promise. As soon as I'm done showing everyone this, we're gonna, well, I'm happy to do questions. Uh, let's take a look at the site here for just a second though. So if you Google Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I'm not gonna make you write down the URL or tell you to write down the URL because it's simple enough just to find it this way. Uh, but if you go to the homepage, you will see at 
the top or towards the top, there are three options. This option, the third option, submit a complaint about a financial product or service. I love this option. The Consumer Financial Bureau will investigate your complaint uh, if it involves any sort of malfeasance from a bank that you use or even a bank that you're using for financing. For example, a mortgage company, a car lender, you name it. They are all subject to uh, management by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So if you have an issue with uh, your bank not doing something it's supposed to do, or perhaps you have a credit card that you want to keep and you're making payments on it and your credit card, uh, well, commits some shenanigans, you can file a complaint on this website for free. It doesn't cost money. Your tax dollars, my tax dollars, everything that we've contributed into the tax base, uh, goes towards this agency. They will investigate it, they will give you updates, and they will actually pretty much do their job usually. So if you click on the link to get started for a complaint, you will see there is a list of what you can complain about. And it's actually a decent amount of stuff. And I do wish that more people complained more using the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because they investigate things. And if they investigate enough things uh, for a specific company, they will prosecute uh, on a very significant financial level. You may have recently read that Wells Fargo was fined in December um, in excess of a billion dollars by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And that's because of, well, shenanigans. Uh, so, do not underestimate this website. Complain, complain, complain. You can't go to this website to complain about a checking or savings account, a credit card, uh, a credit repair service. That's a good one. Uh, a credit report, uh, a debt collection agency. You can definitely call us about those too, but I don't mind anyone complaining about nasty debt collection agencies uh, to the federal government. They get away with too much. Debt settlement. Uh, that's a very good one to complain about. If you were if you were with a debt settlement company and they didn't tell you you had federally protected income before you signed up, by all means, complain with to this agency. Uh, money transfers, like Western Union, uh, mortgages. A lot of people get frustrated with their mortgage companies. Uh, I know I do sometimes. Uh, payday loans. Yeah, there are some pretty shady payday loan places. Personal loans, including title loans. Title loans can be a little bit dubious sometimes with their management. Uh, prepaid cards, student loans, and finally vehicle loans or vehicle leases. So that's a huge amount, uh, a wide swath of financial products that you can complain about. The com the f this agency, they will send you updates. And like I said before, they will attempt to resolve your case, uh, but Filing a complaint doesn't just help you, it helps all of us. Different, different companies have been shut down or fined enough to hurt them because of enough people filing complaints. Uh, the next part is just, I want everyone to know that your information that you submit is uh, related to the company when they investigate, just like any other federal agency or policing agency when you complain. Um, and they will also, uh, publish your information without your identifying details in the consumer complaint database. The consumer complaint database is a pretty frequently updated uh, database of complaints that this agency gets from consumers. And it's just a treasure trove of, well, interesting information about any financial product you're considering. It's, a, it's an interesting read. Uh, so, finally, um, let's go over what they do. You submit your complaint, they give you updates. Uh, as they get a hold of the company, they let you know what the company responded. And very importantly, they're gonna publish your complaint so other people get a heads up. And then they let you know that within 60 days, what they found out and what's been going on. So again, don't, 
don't neglect to complain uh, to this agency if you've had a problem with a bank, a lender, help everyone out. Okie doke. So let's talk about questions. Uh, my, the first question here. My car is going to be repossessed in Illinois. I just got it. I know CarMax Auto Finance of Illinois is going to sell it and ask me to make up the difference. I'm on Social Security. I can't afford this. Help. Sure. I can talk about this. Let's switch over to webcam and get off of this website and let's do it. We all might know, and if we don't, I'm going to tell you, and if you do, I'm sorry. Get a little review here. The law likes to categorize debt by whether or not it has collateral securing repayment, right? For most of us, if we're lucky enough to have financed a car or a home, that usually looks like a car loan or a mortgage because most of us don't have tens of thousands of dollars to go buy a car or home. Those types of debt are called, well, it's secured debt. A few other debts get the power of secured debt thanks to uh, the law, it's typically state law, like HOA fees, they get to act a lot like secured creditors, and uh, property taxes. Property taxes pretty much feels like secured debt. But everything else is unsecured. And when we talk about a motor vehicle, if you can't afford it, if you surrender it, or it's repossessed, uh, freedom here is right, it gets sold, and if it gets sold for less than what you owed against it, that balance, we typically refer to that as uh, the deficiency balance, and you'll get billed for that. But it's not a secured debt because you've lost the collateral. And when it comes to consumer debt, an unsecured debt is an unsecured debt is an unsecured debt is an unsecured debt. Why do I say consumer debt? Well, because technically taxes, federal taxes, that's unsecured too, but it works a little bit differently. So we're going to focus on consumer debt, the bread and butter of helps, uh, bread and butter of my life, essentially, professionally. And the law doesn't care if it's an auto deficiency or if it's a credit card or if it was a payday loan or if it was... A personal loan or you borrowed a hundred dollars from Vinny the loan shark law doesn't care it's unsecured debt and when it comes to unsecured debt even though heavy breathing debt collectors like to make the whole thing seem so mysterious and woo, who knows what can happen to you I'm sure some of you have heard me say that we do know what can happen to you we always know and you should always know the worst case scenario for unsecured debt is uh, the civil justice system. You can be sued for what amounts to breach of contract. Most of the time when our clients are sued, it helps. They are in breach of contract. Uh, they just couldn't afford to pay the debt. If they could have paid it, they wouldn't be our clients because pretty much everyone comes to us after working their tuckuses off to try to do everything they could uh, to afford the debt. Um, but at the end of the day, we're subject to math. If the money's not there, the money's not there. So if you're sued for a debt, you can't afford, you're actually being sued for breach of contract. And even though it's not fun to contemplate a lawsuit, I'm an attorney, uh, receiving a summons and complaint, it's not my favorite thing. I understand that it's scary, but if you understand what a lawsuit and ultimately a judgment for unsecured debt, like another deficiency or a medical bill or a credit card bill, name it, what it can actually do to you, it, it's going to help you sleep a lot better at night. At the end of the day, whether it's for $2 or $200 billion, the rules are the same. A judgment for unsecured debt can do exactly two things. It can go after unprotected income and unprotected assets. It's really just that simple. And that means that the auto deficiency judgment, uh, if Freedom got sued for breach of contract and a judgment was entered, well... It couldn't touch a penny of her social security income. Social security benefits uh, are the most protected form of income in the United States. Some other forms of income reach that level, any federal benefit like veterans benefits. Uh, if you were a federal employee and you have a federally managed pension, you get that same level of protection. Uh, 
she worked for the railroad. But for the most part, we like to talk about Social Security because that's what most of our clients have. And it's always good news for Social Security. If you have Social Security income, you could have been driving a Lamborghini. Uh, I hope you were. That sounds exciting. But if you couldn't afford the Lamborghini and there was a $2 million uh, deficiency balance, I don't care. They could sue you. Sure. Could they do anything to your Social Security? No. Social Security, as most of us know by now, hopefully, is so protected that it's able to extend federal protection to the bank account where it's deposited. That protection is always equal to two times the amount of uh, Social Security benefits you have deposited in there every month. So it's a great way to protect other forms of retirement income like pensions, uh, you know, annuities, even an income from a part-time job, it really does work just like an umbrella. So if you have scooch room in your bank account, uh, your federally protected bank account, you can put other funds at, in there, excuse me, and as long as the balance doesn't exceed two times of uh, your monthly benefit deposit, well, it gets protected too. This protection is incredibly strong. Uh, it's what we call self-executing, which is just a silly legal way of saying automatic. Uh, so we really like it. Uh, um, I'm always about the most efficient way to do things and automatic is, well, it's no effort. So let's go back to the other half of uh, the judgment, uh, which is assets. So we know a judgment for unsecured debt can only go after unprotected income and unprotected assets. What about assets? Well, I don't really think anyone needs to worry too tremendously uh, about asset loss uh, unless they're coming to us with really valuable assets. And I do mean really valuable. But the truth is a lot of states protect m the biggest asset most of us have if we're lucky to have it, which is a home. Um, even if you live in a state, I'm looking at you, Pennsylvania, without a homestead exemption or New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. No homestead exemption whatsoever. Does that mean you lose your home if uh, if you were sued for an auto deficiency? Nope. Doesn't. I don't want anyone to think that. It doesn't work that way. In 20 plus years, I've never, ever, ever seen a home lost for consumer debt. Um, yeah, and your your tricycle, Freedom says she has no assets, but a trike. Uh, yeah, I'm sure your trike is fine. Um, no one's going to want your trike uh, in, in, yeah. And the reality is it's unfair that some states don't have better homestead protection, but that's the joy of living in the United States of America. State law is different from state to state. Uh, some states, like my home state, Oregon, really needs to get its stuff together. It has homestead protection, but not enough. All the states around it have uh, tried to... Well, they have. They've increased their protection significantly, but Oregon can't seem to get it together. But yeah, New Jersey, I don't know what your problem is because houses are expensive in New Jersey. Um, and people in New Jersey deserve to have legal protection for their homes, too. Uh, so that's that's a big deal. Um, Okie doke. So Carol said she changed banks and her new bank puts a six-day hold on checks because she's new, even a state check. That's ridiculous. That would be devastating to so many people. I can't believe that. When I first moved to Southern California, a very poor uh, young 20-something, uh, Wells Fargo put a five-day hold on my paycheck every month. And that was really, really hard. Um, so you should definitely reach out to Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and complain about that. Six days is ridiculous. If you're a person who is depending on your next paycheck to make the rent or make the house payment or buy food, that's that's a long time. The hundred dollars is not enough of a release. Uh, I would love to know, Carol, what's the name of your bank? It's TD Bank. Yeah. We all need to look out for each other. We need to name and shame these banks that are up to shenanigans. That's that's not not at all appropriate, and it's a state check. That's, I mean, fortunately, we're not at the point yet where your state uh, checks are bouncing. Um, Carol asked, does New Jersey use the federal exemption? 
So I believe, Carol, you are asking me about, uh, are you asking me about bankruptcy exemptions? Because those work a little bit differently. Um, some states, like my own, have exemptions that protect us uh, from judgments. And those judgments, or excuse me, those exemptions uh, do a good job. But depending on where you're at, they might not do as good of a job as a federal exemption. But the difference with federal exemptions is uh, they only work when you file bankruptcy. So yeah, New Jersey will let you avail yourself of a, a, a bankrupt, a homestead exemption. Uh, that right now, I believe, is $27,900, which is better than nothing, but that only works for bankruptcy filings. Uh, some states will have uh, really good protections that only apply in bankruptcy and they don't apply to judgments. So when you're looking for exemptions, if you're a Googler like me and you just want to see what's out there, you want to be sure that you're actually looking at uh, protections from judgments and not just bankruptcy exemptions. Not that knowing bankruptcy exemptions isn't helpful. Uh, it's just sometimes people get confused. Some states don't have laws that apply to both. Some states have laws that protect you outside of bankruptcy, uh, but not so much within the bankruptcy. And federal exemptions are uh, in bankruptcy aren't allowed everywhere. Your state has to elect to... Uh, let you do that in your state. Um, so let's talk about this question. Can a credit or debt collector garnish my social security income without a civil judgment? And could there be a lien against a vehicle paid for with social security income? Well, the first part is uh, a hard and fast no on many levels. So first of all, nobody gets to garnish income whatsoever, any type of income without a, or touch a bank account without a judgment. There are a few exceptions. Those exceptions are uh, governmental. Federal government doesn't have to do anything to get access to your bank account. It's the federal government. Uh, but anyone else, a consumer creditor absolutely has to sue you and you have to get notice of the lawsuit and they have to get a judgment against you first. But even if they have a judgment, if I'm a creditor or a debt collector, I'm not well, I'm not garnishing your social security income. I can't touch it with a 10 foot pole. I don't care who I am. I don't, I mean, I can be ultra fancy American Express and you owe me $3 billion because you just, you tried to uh, feed the continent, use your imagination, doesn't matter. I can't touch your uh, social security income not to non-starter. If I was a creditor and I tried to uh, issue a writ and serve that writ on the Social Security Administration, uh, uh, it makes me laugh thinking about it. I don't even know where it would go. I, I assume it would go to the garbage, but what room it would go to the garbage in? Can it make it to the next floor? I, I don't have any idea because it's an absolute non-starter. Um, the next part of the question is, could there be a lien? against a vehicle paid for with Social Security. Absolutely. Yeah, assets don't get sourced uh, when it comes to Social Security protection. The only thing that gets sourced because of Social Security protection is, uh, excuse me, is your bank account. That's it. But no, if I buy a motor vehicle with Social Security benefits, it's not more protected because I bought it with Social Security benefits. That would be really nice. Uh, and sourcing of, uh, or looking at sources of income to figure things out about assets legally absolutely does happen. It sure does. And so it's not a bad question, um, but it doesn't get hap it doesn't happen when it comes to debt collection and protection from debt collection at all, unfortunately. Um, so, booby doop boop boop. Uh, yes, Kathy Kelly brought up a point. She's concerned about uh, credit unions sometimes not following the law of protection for Social Security. And she's not wrong. Uh, unfortunately, we can't prevent people from breaking the law. Uh, if we could, we could use uh, the money we spend on prisons and jails and all that stuff 
all of those things, uh, the criminal justice system, it would go away because we would wave our magical no crime wand and it would be great. Uh, but when it comes to credit unions, they sometimes have an issue with having less than robust uh, legal departments if they have one in the first place. If you talk to a consumer debt attorney, a lot of us don't like credit unions uh, for the fact that they don't always pay attention to the law, not just with bank account protection or credit union account protection, with a lot of issues. Uh, so when it comes to the federal law protecting uh, your bank account, that became effective starting in 2011. Uh, we are in 2023 now. That's a long time. They should have gone with the program, and many of them are now. I don't want everyone with a credit union to think, oh shoot, they're not going to be able to protect my social security income. That's not necessarily the case. It's when we do have the incredibly infuriating problem of trying to teach a, a financial institution about federal law 90% of the time it's a credit union. And those situations are really, really horrible for the person who's trying to get access to their own darn money. But honestly, they're horrible for us too. I can always tell you off the top of my head whose account is giving me a terrible stomach ache because some credit union could have followed the law. Uh, it drives me absolutely crazy. It breaks my heart to make anyone even spend an hour trying to get their own money, let alone you know, having to fight the bank or the credit union, excuse me, that's been making money off of you. Um, so yeah, sometimes credit unions do screw that up. But again, I don't want anyone to think that all credit unions don't know how to follow the law. That's not true. Most credit unions do follow the law when it comes to bank account protection. It's just that when uh, a financial institution calls, or not, excuse me, a client calls and says their uh, credit union let a, uh, a bank levy or garnishment go through on their account, that's a very big deal to us. We take it very, very seriously. So we have a lot of feelings about credit unions because we really, really, really don't want our clients to not have access to their own money. That's not okay. And, you know, this is just a simple law in the first place. Uh, so does that mean you need to change to a credit union or from a credit union to a bank? Not necessarily. If you've been with your credit union for a while, you feel good about them. You can absolutely feel okay to be there. They've been there for 20 years. Uh, you've been banking with the bank for 20 years. Is it risky not to change? I will never tell you anything is 100% perfect unless I can personally guarantee that. If it was me, I would change to a bank, but that's just because I've been doing this for over 20 years, but the odds of them screwing up are still pretty low. They will very much probably still follow the law if and when a judgment is entered against you and the creditor with a judgment or any plaintiff with a judgment really attempts to levy your account. Uh, but are banks perfect? Banks are usually pretty good, but banks are not always perfect either. If you are ever thinking about changing uh, the to a different account uh, to, to have your social security deposit in, into or your protected federal benefits so you can take advantage of that amazing protection, I usually uh, suggest going with a big bank. I am not a fan of the big banks. I, <laughs> I'm not going to be on any commercials anytime soon, but they have the best legal departments. Uh, obviously, you'd want to switch to a big bank you don't owe money to, but by and large, the big banks do a really good job following the law. So uh, what are those banks? Citibank, almost always. I've never seen Citibank screw up uh, bank account protection. Wells Fargo, I am very much not a fan of Wells Fargo, but they are very good at following the law, uh, protecting bank accounts. I've seen Chase make one mistake in nine years, and that wasn't even uh, about a bank levy, uh, but they do a really good job. Um, yeah, Bank of America, believe it or not, I can tell you lots of hilarious Bank of America stories, but their legal department's good. They do a pretty good job with protected bank account. Um, and so... Yeah, if you have questions about your credit union or bank account, you can give us a call. But it's up to you what you want to do. Uh, 
I can only ever tell you what I know personally, what I've encountered, and my personal experiences, big banks do the best job protecting your income. That said, I've seen little tiny mom and pop, if you can even call them that, but very local little banks, very, very much uh, be very familiar with the law, do a great job. Uh, and honestly, 99% of the time, most people don't even notice when their bank or credit union is doing its job. They only find out that a creditor uh, attempted to levy their bank account after the bank or credit union are already rejected it. So I don't want anyone to think this is a really common problem with credit unions not following the law. It's just, well, when the law does get broken, it's credit unions 90% of the time. Uh, so um, let's see here. So let's talk really quickly about um, Dr. Angie Stone's question about a 1099C. It's that time of year. It's tax time. And without getting too in the weeds, 1099Cs, for most of us, they are not a bad thing. They are a, they are a sign that your bank uh, canceled that debt. That's what we always hope for. But 1099C, uh, like any other 1099, is income. 1099 just literally means income. That's not employment income. If you are already required to file taxes, you're going to want to include that 1099C in your uh, tax return. If you're not, then Eric always says that you probably are going to be, and I don't even mean probably, I mean virtually certainly going to be okay not filing taxes because you're not required to anyways. Uh, the reality is 1099C income only counts to the extent you're solvent, which means that if you have liabilities that are greater than your assets, the amount of that liability or your insolvency uh, offsets 1099C income anyways. So if you do need to file taxes and you received a 1099C, let us know. Uh, I've spent a long time putting together an exhaustive guide on how to how to file your taxes with that income. Uh, but if you don't, yeah, then it's up to you, but the odds are very high that you don't need to file taxes if you didn't already have to. Uh, the IRS has a very good tool on its website where you can put in all the numbers and it will tell you whether or not you need to file taxes. And that's usually my recommendation is they use that really good IRS tool. Um, so Greg Roberts asked, is, you, is your opinion on just, is it my opinion to do nothing if you have nothing? I'm not quite sure what do nothing means. Um, but my opinion is always to protect yourself or look out for yourself as much as these banks or creditors or financing agencies, you name it, as much as they are looking out for themselves. I guarantee you they're using every law they can uh, to get more money out of everything. If you don't have to, um, if you don't have income that's vulnerable, to judgments. If you are a judgment proof person, you can absolutely use the laws that are literally there because, well, they were created to protect people receiving those forms of income. You can use them to your advantage. And honestly, you're not making up new ideas. Those laws exist for this reason. Do not give up your protected income to pay a debt 20 times over or pay interest in egregious amounts. The reality is most, most of the times when I have dealt with consumer debt, almost all of our clients have either paid the debt over, over and over again multiple times, or they've done everything they can, but they are dealing with creditors that have taken billions or hundreds of millions of dollars of governmental bailouts um, funded with tax dollars. These are not places that are going hungry because you don't pay your $900 auto deficiency. Just take care of yourself. My advice is to keep yourself fed and take care of yourself. If you're on SSI, you need every penny you have just to buy groceries. If you drive, <laughs> good luck to buy gas. Life is a struggle already um, trying to figure out how to survive when you have a low fixed income. I, I hate hearing that people are going without food, heat, basic necessities. 
it just breaks my heart. So that's always going to be my advice. Uh, freedom was told by H&R Block to always file taxes, even if she only has Social Security, to protect her Social Security number. Is that true? No, that's nonsense. Uh, it, if we break down that suggestion, so H&R Block is saying by you filing a tax return, it protects your Social Security number. My guess would be they their logic is that by filing a tax return, you are preventing someone else from filing a, a fraudulent tra tax return uh, and pretending to be you. That would be my only guess uh, as to that strategy, but I promise that's not a huge problem that's really happening that often. And if the IRS did receive two tax returns for the same year, it will definitely let you know. But no, if you're not legally required to file taxes, you don't have to file taxes to protect your social security number. That's that's really strange advice, and I'm sorry that they said that to you. Um, so there is one more question here. So Carol said, if you own your home free and clear, but your debts exceed your liquid assets, are you still insolvent? So insolvency is determined and if you need my really riveting guide to how to handle 1099c income just give us a call and let us know but for for tax purposes and honestly for most legal pur purposes bankruptcy you name it insolvency is determined by taking the total amount of all of your assets liquid and illiquid uh, and one really needs to be certain when figuring out the total amount of your assets to use market value, what you could really sell them for. The reality is a lot of us are really grateful for our things, which is a good thing. You're a happier person usually if you're grateful. I don't fault anyone for being grateful and appreciating their stuff and thinking it's wonderful, but people really have a problem with overvaluing their assets. With your home, sure, I get that. A lot of us live in places where property has become more valuable, but everything else from your couch to your computer, especially your computers, it's not worth as much as you think. The value you want is if you put all that stuff on the front lawn or wherever you live, took it to the pawn shop, what could you actually functionally get for it? Most of the time, your couch, your sheets, your old refrigerator, it's not going to get as much as you think. But once you have a realistic idea of the market value of what you really have, you add all that up. If you want a home, it's all of the equity or all of the value of your home. The realistic market value of your home if you had to sell it right now. Not if you replace the roof that needs replacing or you know, fix the damage that your neighbor's dog did to your front yard. It's just what it can sell for right now. You add all of that up and that's, well, that's a total amount of all of your assets. That's one column. And then the other column is all of your liabilities. So if you have a house uh, that's financed, you put your mortgage there. If you have a motor vehicle that's financed, put the car loan there or truck loan, any credit card debt, any debt if you're a helps client, any debt you've given to help, any debt that you owe. So once you have your asset column totaled up and your liability column totaled, you subtract the total amount of your liability from uh, the total amount of your assets. Usually we refer to that as net worth, but for our purposes, for tax purposes, it's the degree of your solvency. It's how solvent you are. Uh, and that amount, if it's positive, then yeah, you're solvent. And that just means that your 1099C income won't be offset by your insolvency. If you are insolvent though, you get to use that amount and subtract it from whatever 1099C income you've received. And again, this is really just an important consideration if you're already required to file taxes. Uh, um, and then someone else asked, if, your credit, if a credit card or loan charges your debt off, can they still report your payment as being late almost two years later? If you're asking me, can the original late payments, can those still be on your credit report? Sure. Yeah. Things can go on your credit report for up to seven years from the time of whatever happened. 
happen to the late payment, you name it, it can stay in there for seven years with the exception of bankruptcy filings, which stay on your credit report for 10 years. Uh, if it's been completely quiet and nothing's been on there and then two years later, you get a late payment posting, if it's within the seven years, it can still be on there. However, if it's really past the seven years, then by all means, dispute it. And you never have to pay anyone to dispute uh, incorrect items on your credit report. Please don't pay someone to do it. It's free. If you need to know how to do that, let us know. Give us a call. I love emailing guides on how to dispute items that aren't correct on your credit report. I've had to do it. It's very common to have incorrect information on your credit report. Don't be afraid of doing it. It's it's great. Uh, credit reporting agencies, as we all probably know, know right now are pretty loosey-goosey with the details. Um, Yeah, so also someone wrote that American Express uh, was charged off in 2020 and they report it as a late payment. Well, I'm not quite sure if the question is that it was charged off and the status shows as a late payment. They can show the, the payment being late when it was late. If it's if it's showing as a late payment uh, you know, way after the fact, that's a different story. Um, but you're not you're not alone if you think there's something fishy going on with your credit report. I promise you, you're probably right. Uh, the first time I had to get my first big girl credit report, I was stunned to find out there was a one hundred eighty thousand uh, dollar debt on my credit report to American Express. Now I was twenty three, trying to finance a refrigerator from Sears, uh, and I yeah. That was more money than I could even imagine. I didn't have an American Express card. They just put the wrong thing on my credit report. I had to dispute it. Uh, so I believe anything when it comes to credit reporting. Um, yeah. And someone wrote, I love it. The most expensive thing you own is your dentures. Yeah, those are expensive. Dental work is expensive beyond all belief. Um, and then someone wrote, request any lawyer to prove they have a license to practice law in your state. Yeah, definitely. You can look up anyone in the California, or California, sorry. That's where I practice law. Uh, you can look anybody up on their state web, bar's website if they tell you they're an attorney. If they are going to be in court uh, with you to show up, they sh should definitely be admitted to practice law in your state. Um... And then finally, because we're talking about it a little bit, and then I'll let everyone go. I feel like, yeah, we're probably going along, and I'm sorry for that. You are all interesting, and I like talking to you. Uh, Charge-offs. Back, back, I'd say even like 10 years ago, charge-offs meant one specific thing. That essentially the creditor had closed your account and taken the loss, and it was done. But charge-off now is really used... Well, it's kind of used the way we use literally now, or at least my kids use literally, which doesn't mean literally anymore. It just means I really want to be emphatic about this and tell you I'm feeling strongly. But charge off is used for a lot of different things. If an account's charged off, it can still be sold. If an account's charged off, it doesn't mean that the creditor has relinquished their contractual rights. If an account shows up on your credit report is charged off, it doesn't mean that it can't show up with a debt collector. Um, it just, a lot of creditors use that now to show that they've stopped collecting on it. Um, so yeah, charge off doesn't mean what it used to mean, like a lot of other things, I guess. At any rate, I know I give you a ton of information. If you have any questions about anything we've discussed today, please feel free to give us a call. We'll try our best to help. Uh, I hope everyone stays warm. Uh, out there. I know it's cold in a lot of places. I hope everyone has enough to eat and comfortable socks. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time to meet with us. I, I'm really always grateful uh, for the uh, kindness uh, so many of you extend my way. Uh, so yeah, have a great day, everyone.